In this video, I want to review some of the key topics that we saw in chapter nine, dealing with electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation, uh, electron configuration, and uh, orbital diagram. So the electronic configuration and the orbital diagram, they're telling us how the electrons are laid out uh, in the different orbitals around the nucleus of the atom. The way electro electromagnetic radiation is related to this topic is the fact that um, right when those electrons move to higher energy orbits and then move back down to lower, lower energy, uh, I should say orbitals, then what you see is th there's a there's a like a release of electromagnetic radiation depending on the uh, change from the excited state to the ground state. In the lecture, we saw that illustrated with like the Bohr atom and the different uh, line spectra uh, with the like associated with hydrogen and and some of the other elements. Now this type of question here, that's just this is just asking specifically about electromagnetic radiation and what are the like relative different types of um, light that we have in nature. You know, usually when we say light, we're talking about visible light, what we see. But right, there's a whole range of different types of radiation that we see in the in the world around us. And the visible light is only a small sliver of that full spectrum here. And you should know like the relative positions of the types of radiation as well as the wavelength of the visible light here. And when I say relationships, it's not just, you know, which one has a lower energy with respect to another. It even gets into issues like wavelength and frequency, frequency for example. So yes, you know, notice that the way this diagram is labeled, it's just dealing with high and low energies. But there's a couple other properties of radiation that we know as wavelength and frequency. And what we see is that on the, um, well, energy and frequency are proportional to each other, meaning that if we have a type of radiation that has low, low energy, then that also means that we're dealing with something with low frequency. And then as you move up in the different types of radiation with respect to energy, then you also get to higher frequency as well. Wavelength, what we find is when wavelength is that it's inversely proportional to either frequency or energy. Wavelength is a distance. So you can imagine from like peak to peak on a wave like that, that would be the, the wavelength. And by the way, it is given this lambda symbol. And so that's why I'm going to say for wavelength, if you're dealing with low frequency, low energy, then you're talking about a long wavelength. Whereas you get to the other end with the higher energies, notice that these shrink. So this is a short wavelength. Now for this question here, notice we're only dealing with four of the different types of radiation. And it doesn't really matter which one I start with. Let's just say, let's do wavelength first. So on the wavelength perspective of the different four, um, types of radiation increasing, so you know it's going to be short to long wavelength. And the short wavelengths that's associated with the highest energy there. That's X rays. Next is visible, and then finally microwaves. Now, with respect to frequency, which is actually given this little symbol, looks like a V. It's um, from the Greek alphabet. It's called a nu. And sort of the map, the information about frequency on top of this sequence here, then we're talking about this would be high frequency and low frequency on this end. And it turns out right, energy has is proportional to frequency, so high energy, low energy. And then just to put this sort of in the context of how the problem is asking for you to arrange these different types of radiation, Increasing value, well, you know, this was true for wavelength. This is increasing, but the, with respect to energy and frequency, it's increasing as it goes in that direction. So again, wavelength and then these two, they are inversely proportional to each other. As one goes up, the others go down. Another important topic in this chapter, probably the two most important topics, electronic configurations and orbital diagrams. 
And basically, these two things are telling you the same information, okay? How are the electrons laid out around the nucleus? It's just they, they look different. Like, for example, the orbital diagram, that's more likely to look something like that, where you break apart each orbital and we put in electrons, and I'll show examples of that in a minute, we're using arrows. Whereas the electronic configuration, that's where you did, you know, like, I don't want to put exact numbers in here, just to give you, you have like X, Y, and Z, etc., depending on the size of the atom. It's more of a condensed form of the same information that you see in the orbital diagram. As it turns out, you can actually determine this sequence of, of sublevels based on how the periodic table is structured. Let me just do that, take a few minutes to talk about that. I'm going to look at this block. So the red would be the S block. This is often referred to as the P block. That's the D block. And if you need it, down here is the F block. So if I wanted to see this sequence, if I wanted a tool to help memorize this sequence, then what I can do is actually just go up through the periodic table based on ascending atomic number, right? These numbers that we see there. And just sort of march your way through the different regions on the periodic table. And what you'll see is that as you cross through the different regions, it actually maps out this sequence down here. All right, so I don't have two pointers on the screen here, but you know, just if you go up and, and sort of just let me talk it through, this is the 1s, and hot helium is actually could be, you can imagine helium being placed in there just for convenience sake, make everything sort of symmetrical. Helium's two. Lithium's three, so you want to restart here. That goes through then the 2s block. Not 1s, 2s, next is 2p. Well, that's as you start entering this group on the p block here. So what we do is then we number 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, etc., depending on you know how far you need to go down the periodic table. And again, just sort of keep making your way up through the proc table. Neon's 10, drop back down to 11. Which block am I in here with 3s? Well, that's the next one up on the energy scale. 12 to 13, transitions through the 3p. There's the 3p. And then notice as I get to argon, atomic number 18, and then I have to go to potassium, atomic number 19. And by that point, I'm at the 4S group next. And then now I start entering the, the D block. And if I started the 1S, or if I started the S block at 1, the P block at 2, well, as it turns out, the D block starts at 3, etc. And then just sort of, sort of a complete a thought here, 1, 2, 3, the F block starts at 4. Now, it's unlikely you have to deal with F block too much, but so it's less of an issue. But you could, I mean, if you need to. But if we continue on through our sequence, right, 3D, 4P, 3D, and then 4P. And then I could map out the rest of this if I needed to, again, just by sort of going through this sequence. While I'm thinking about it, let me just point out this F block just a little bit. I know it's hard to see, 57 to 72, that's the transition in the atomic number. Where's 58? Well, 58's down here. So like if you were marching through this row on the product table, you'd actually go through what this is, 5s, 6s, 6s, transition through 4p, and then back up to 5d, that kind of sequence. And then something similar for the actinine group as well. Now, for us, the vast majority, we won't even touch the F sublevel. Let's just do a couple examples, get a feel of what we're doing. Now, actually, I want to change this just a little bit. I don't want to do argon here. Let's do like sulfur, something close to argon, but not quite, because I want to talk about a few things when we start laying out this information. And again, what's the sequence? Well, let me just sort of quickly do this. 1S... 2s, 
3S, and that's as far as I'm going to go because I'm on the third row to finding sulfur. I don't have to mess with the D block, so I'm going to ignore that. Where do my P uh, orbital show up for the first one? It's at the two energy level. So 2P, 3P. And again, you know, I'm just going to march my way down or up the periodic table based on atomic number. I'm going to write down what I see. 1s, 2s, 2p, back to 3s, and then finally to 3p. And then something we learned is that every time you see an s orbital, or s sublevel, I should say there's one orbital, one orbital. On the p sublevel, there are three orbitals. If you needed the d, the d would have five orbitals. One way to keep track of this, I mean, you work with it a little bit and it sort of get you get accustomed to it, but if you just count over by twos, one, two, three, four, five. If you can remember that little sequence. And again, I don't have to mess with these, it's just this group here. And I'm going up to 16 electrons. That's all I gotta lay out in this sequence. We actually saw the rules on the previous slide. Let's take a peek. I really talk about these. But these are the basic rules to really, con this, the, these rules, they construct what we say the ground state. Any deviation from this set of rules would like be considered an excited state where you know an electron has gained energy somehow and now it's changed somehow. The first two aren't too bad. You start with low energy, go to high energy. Okay, and you can kind of see it here. Now, just for convenience, right, I'm not using the vertical layout. I'm using the horizontal layout, but, you know, this is associated with low energy, and then this is associated with higher energy. So I'm going to start with 1s, and I'm going to move up and, and, you know, fill in the 16 electrons. Second rule here, two electrons per orbital with opposite spins. Now, we don't really talk that much about this topic in this class, okay? Just to say that, like for example, I can get two electrons in the S sublevel, and what they're gonna look like is that, okay? So we use these arrows to represent electrons. Briefly, um, the arrow up and the arrow down is trying to represent what we call the like the the magnetic properties, if you will, of the electron. If you take the Chem 151 class, you get to know about this a lot, a lot more. Just know that when they're paired up as opposite spins, they're just lower energy. They're more in the ground state. Not the ground state. I mean, that's, that's the low energy state. You know, what's the easiest way, if you will, to arrange the electrons? What creates the lowest energy state for that atom? And we found that these rules do that. Now, usually these two aren't too bad. It's Hung's rule. This is kind of a little weird. Let's just apply it as we go through this example. Oh, actually, first off, when it says degenerate orbitals, these are orbitals on the same energy level. So P, D, and F are all degenerate orbitals. Right? They're on the same energy level. And what we find is that they get, each orbital gets half filled with an electron before you go back and fill up an orbital. Let's just illustrate that, it'll be easier. Okay, 16 electrons, okay? Low energy to high energy, two already in place, three, four. I'm coming to my first degenerate set and I'm going to you know play the game of Hund's rule and just apply it exactly how I'm reading it, okay, the way I'm interpreting it. And it says I'm going to half fill each orbital before going back and then filling up the orbital. Now, in this particular example, since I have 16 electrons, this sublevel is going to be completely filled. So at the end of the day, it's going to be that pattern. There's nothing. It's almost as if Hun's rule didn't exist for that one. Let's keep going on, okay? There we go. At this point, I have used 12 electrons. So I have four more to divvy out. And notice 
How do I know I got four more? One, two, three, four before I make it up to sulfur there. Okay, so I'm going to put my last four electrons in this degenerate set of orbitals. This is where Hund's rule definitely applies. And so following the letter of the law here, uh, half fill, one, two, three. I have one more left over, and now I'm going to pair it up with my first orbital here. And I'm done. This is the orbital diagram for sulfur. Now let me use this orbital diagram to talk about a few other little things, such as the core electrons and the valence electrons. These are the electrons that would be involved in a chemical reaction. These are the electrons where we actually saw it on the, the, the electronic dot symbol or Lewis dot symbol for the elements. I'm sorry. It's what we'll see in chapter 10 <laughs> when we start doing Lewis structures. So there are six valence electrons for sulfur. And what we do here is we just sort of lay them out one at a time going around sulfur until we run out of those valence electrons. And notice what it's doing here. This little symbol, basically what you can think of is that these lone pair electrons, or these um, uh, paired up electrons here, are basically representing those two groups of electrons, those two sets of electrons. Whereas that guy and that guy representing those two single electrons. Now, I'm not going to get into the use of this right here. Chapter 10 will do that there. Right now, it's just an association between orbital diagram and a symbol that you're going to see in chapter 10. Now, notice that these six dots here, I'm basically ignoring the core electrons. Totally fine. The core electrons are not involved in chemical reactions. And oftentimes we ignore, well, yeah, oftentimes we ignore them. The main role that the core electrons are playing in this chapter is really going from like this form of the electronic structure to something called like the, the abbreviated electronic configuration or the, the noble gas abbreviation electronic configuration. There's a few different names for it. Abbreviated form. Because what you have to recognize here, I mean, what does this represent actually? Well, it represents the everything being filled up through the 2p, through the 2p block, 10 electrons. It actually represents neon here. And so in the abbreviated form of the electronic configuration, if I was to write it for uh, sulfur, let's just do that, it would look like this, where we sort of condense this information. I mean, when we see like the four electrons there, we still have to remember, okay, well, yeah, great. There's two lone pair electrons in that notation, but again, it's a much more compact notation, especially when you use this abbreviated form. And I'll do it again in the next problem. Let's do that. Okay, so now this one, something a little bit bigger, and we're just gonna stick with the electronic configuration. And I'll do both types. I'll do the full electronic configuration. I'll also do the condensed electronic configuration. Now remember 10 is right here. We have 50 electrons to lay out. We're still going to march up through our typical sequence. And notice I have to go all the way down to this, what, fifth row. Fifth row. One through five. 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s. Right? S block starts at 1. P block starts at 2. So that valence shell for 10 is actually including the um, 5P group. I've got to transition through two of the D blocks. Okay, so 1, 2, 3D, 4D. Now the orbital diagram, if I was to draw it, which I'm not, and the full-blown electron, electronic configuration, it's fairly busy. Let's go ahead and get started. So again, I just go up ascending atomic number. 3P, right? I'm at the end of argon. Go back to now. Now I've got 4S, 3D, 4P, 5S, 
4D, and then finally 5P. So now I've just laid out the sublevels, and I'm sort of traveling through as I go up in ascending atomic numbers. And now I want to go back and add the superscript to tell me how many electrons are in there. Remember, for the, the S orbital, right, there's only one orbital for the S sublevel, you're going to have 10 electrons, or I'm sorry, two electrons in each one, in each sublevel. For each P, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's six electrons. There's 10 elements for each D sublevel. Okay, well, that represents 10 electrons. And since I'm going all the way through the 4D, then all 10 are going to be filled into those uh, 4D orbitals. So the 2 and the 6 and the 10 are the numbers that I add here. D is going to be 10. And since, you know, yeah, this is completely filled up, so there's a 2 for the 5S as well. Again, I'm going all the way through the D uh, sublevel, so 10 electrons are in that D sublevel. It's now this last upper sublevel that's not completely full. How many electrons do I have left over? One, two electrons. I'm not going to go back and count this, but if you added up all those numbers there, it would equal the 50 for the uh, 10, for the atomic number for, for the element 10. Now this is the full or unabbreviated electronic configuration. Let's look at the abbreviated form or the noble gas form or the condensed form. And what you have to be able to do is recognize where are my core electrons. Well, to do that, you're basically, right, 10 is our element, and now you're just sort of, now you're backtracking and you're looking for your first noble gas that you're going to come to, krypton. What, where, where does krypton end at? Well, it ends with the 4p block. There's the 4p P block right there. So what I can do is let the kr in brackets represent that entire set of core electrons. And then what's the rest of it? Well, it's just what's left over there. And that's it. You can see that, especially for these larger elements, really, I mean, you rarely talk about the full electronic configuration. Because again, the core electrons don't even get involved in chemical reactions, so who cares, really? Just all the sublevels are full, they're stable, they're non-reactive. The reactive portion is up top here. And so that's why we open it up and we see what's sitting there. And that really covers the most important topics for chapter nine. Thanks.